Hello everyone and welcome to my next video on what is probably going to be one of the more controversial topics you can possibly talk about in sim racing and that is of course does equipment in sim racing make you any quicker it's more expensive you get better feel you get all of that good stuff but do you actually get raw lap time out of it we're going to be discussing that but first a shout out to everyone who has subscribed we hit 400 subscribers which was actually my end of year target and we've hit it before <laughs> we've even managed to get into December yet. So that is fantastic. Thank you all for that. And uh, also thoughts in the comment as well of a slightly different perspective. You get a beautiful view of, well, a bit more me, which is not a beautiful view, but you get more model cars in the background. And I also noticed before I started recording it, my, uh, my Gatorade bottle. It's also in the shot. So enjoy that, I guess. I'm going to have to get rid of that, aren't I? <laughs> God damn it. Eek. We're good. But let me know if you do prefer my videos with the wheel, actually in shot, or without the wheel and having a bit more being able to talk to you than having a wheel in my face. Now before we start, it is important to note as well, these are my thoughts and opinions. Where I can, I'll be backing them up with facts and physics to prove my points, but otherwise these are my thoughts and opinions, so just bear that in mind that of course there are going to be differing views on this topic all the time. But we're not just going to be discussing the usual stuff either, so not just the, you know, wheel bases, your wheel rims, your pedals, and whatever else it might be. I want to also go into other depths as well. Your rig, your seat, your monitors, handbrakes, anything else. We're going to be discussing that in this video, so otherwise, let's dig into topic number one, which is the big one, I think, for a lot of people. Steering wheel bases. So I've been sim racing for seven years now, which is actually a third of my life. So that's kind of incredible when you think about it. But in that time, I've used a Logitech Driving Force GT, a G27, a G29, a Thrustmaster TSPC, and now onto my Simucube 2 Pro. Every single wheel I've upgraded to has been a better version of the last one. It's been an improvement in some way, whether it be feel, response, you know, anything, whether it's even just raw strength. It has been a lot better than the previous one. But does any of that actually make me any faster? That is the question because so many people think if you go from a Fanatec to a direct drive wheel, BAM there's two tenths of melee, BAM consistency here, speed there, sectors purple everywhere. No, not the case at all. Over an entire stint, I think it's pretty well conceived that a higher quality wheel is going to be faster with a better feel of the tyres, allowing you to actually manage tyre wear better over the stint. But overall, does a higher quality wheel actually equal one lap pace? To cut to the chase very, very quickly, I believe it does make you ever so slightly faster, but before anyone goes out and buys a brand new Simu Cube or whatever, I'm gonna say it only benefits you to the degree of two or three hundredths of a second. Let me explain. With a higher quality wheel such as a direct drive, you have a much faster input time with the simulator you are driving, which does play a big factor in certain situations. Let's say you are qualifying a Bell Isle and about to enter turn 6. There is a wall right at the apex of the corner, so if you turn in a fraction too early, you find yourself running the risk of hitting the wall and not only destroying your lap, but your car too. And unless you're new in sim racing, most of you will know that's a big problem. With a lower quality wheel that may be gear or belt driven, the input time for your steering wheel is going to be slightly slower for two main reasons. The first being the resolution of your wheel, which in basic terms is how sensitive your wheel is to movement. Most wheels on the market these days exceed 65,000 steps, so this is rarely a concern. However, my Simucube 2 Pro has a resolution of over 4 million steps per revolution, making it far more accurate to micro adjustments. Secondly, a belt driven wheel can have slip on the belts when you turn the wheel quite quickly, giving a very brief loss of precision. To the naked eye, this would be hard to track. However, for those sim racers seeking every tenth of a second, this becomes a problem. So back to Bell Isles turn 6, on a belt or gear driven wheel, when you are turning in too early towards the wall, your quick correction to steer out of the corner and delay your turn in is actually delayed in itself to a couple of hundredths of a second compared to a direct drive wheel, which sometimes can be the difference between hitting that inside wall and missing it. These are the cases where a direct drive wheel will benefit you in lap time. Those micro adjustments you want to make through a corner will be registered a lot earlier. On a regular lap, this won't save you much time, but every 200 races or so, maybe this could be the difference that saves your race. It's the exact same situation when it comes to monitors. Having a 60Hz monitor versus a 144Hz monitor 
You're getting information a little bit quicker than your competitors. And what that means is you can adjust the balance of your car throughout a corner through visual input alone a little bit quicker. To put that into terms, let's say you're on a slightly older wheel, 10 years old, belt driven, and you're on a qualifying lap at Silverstone heading into Cops. High speed, loaded up in a GT car, and you don't have that much fuel through the wheel, you don't know what's actually going on. But visually, you can see the car just rotating a little bit. Having a 144 hertz monitor, you're going to get that rotation in the car visually a little bit sooner because you've got almost, well, you've got over double the refresh rate of someone on a 60 hertz monitor. So whilst we're literally talking about hundreds and thousands of a second here, like I mentioned at Belle Isle, in the Belle Isle example, sometimes that is all the advantage you need just to be able to correct a car and save a lap time and all of that stuff. Whether or not that is actually going to improve your lap times outright, whether that means the difference between a purple sector and spinning the car, it is hard to say. Overall though, it is tough to determine if that is actually going to improve your lap time overall, because I feel like with a 60Hz monitor and 144Hz monitor, the difference in actual outright lap time is going to be next to nothing in my opinion, because it doesn't change where you're trying to position the car, it doesn't change where the grip is available, it doesn't change how you feel the grip. Overall, I don't think monitors play that big of a difference in terms of actually understanding the balance of the car through a qualifying lap. So I'm going to say there's actually no performance gained in a better monitor, but in terms of immersion and stuff like that, absolutely there might be, but it doesn't give you any better understanding of the car's balance beyond just visually seeing the car is sliding, and at that time, lap time is gone. I'm trying to do this video at the point of absolute lap time, so absolutely, you know, with a wheel, having that better input, is that going to help you? Yes, I think in some very rare cases it will, and it will help you achieve those lap times. But a better monitor, I'm going to say no, there's no lap time gained here. Now, for this next one, there is a big advantage gained, and out of all of the advantages I'm talking about today, this is the biggest one by a pretty big margin. I'm saying this can save up to half a second to almost 1.5 seconds if you really get it right. And I'm of course talking about double or second clutches, and the ability they have to get you off the line. Of course, you're only going to be gaining that half a second to 1.5 seconds once in the race. You're not going to be getting it that much. But we saw in the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series, especially at, I think it was uh, Imola. Um, it might have been the uh, Pro Series for the Grand Prix Series. Um, one of the Koanda cars, I think it was, just got an absolutely ridiculous launch off of the start. It was like third on the grid, bolted into first. And it was just incredible, and it was all down to the second clutches. And basically what it is, it allows you to get your optimum RPM and basically just release the clutch absolutely perfect with your correct bite point. So you can basically practice your starts and have it completely replicated when the time it is for the green flag to drop. Out of all the advantages, that is the biggest one and I don't think there's really much doubt or second guessing about this one. Second clutches, definitely a performance gain over your rivals. Some sims have started to bring in factors to alleviate this, so they've got button mappings and key bindings you can do to help create a, a similar effect to second clutches, but overall, an advantage is an advantage, this is a big one. And to kick things off once again with another advantage that I think is worth probably about one to two tenths of a second in Rallycross, is having a handbrake. Now the reason why I say this is because being able to actually adjust your percentage of actual handbrake input is quite a big thing because it can determine whether you're slowing the rear wheel or locking the rear wheel and that can help with the rotation in all kinds of different ways. This will only affect Rallycross of course but in games like iRacing which is the sim I mainly choose to race on, when you have a button mapped to the handbrake it only does 0% and 100% which means you've either got no locking of the wheel or all of the locking of the wheel. Having a handbrake allows you to adjust that individually, I think is a very large advantage because you can actually change the pitch so much with the handbrake. So again, I don't think there's too much discussion needed on the handbrake. Big advantage, another tenth to two tenths gained there in certain situations. So one of the bigger talking points as well is of course pedals. Do pedals make a difference? Yes, but not the generic stuff. So throttle and braking, I don't feel too much of a gain because whether you're using Hoiskenveld Ultimate pedals 
or Logitech G29 pedals. 60% braking input is still 60%. The game doesn't know what pedals you're using. At the end of the day, it's the same input. You're still going to get the exact same effect no matter what you're doing. It comes down to the sim racer to actually achieve that percentage. And that's where the lap time is going to be gained. Knowing where the braking threshold of each car is, being able to hit it, and knowing how quick you can get back on the throttle without bursting into wheel spin. From pedal to pedal, that won't change. Consistency might, especially on braking with a higher set of quality pedals, but lap time, no. But if you're using like it for retro cars, so a Nissan GTP ZXT or the Audi 90 GTO, which do require the clutch to be quick, then there is a slight advantage. On the Hoist Convert Ultimate pedals, when you actually use the clutch, it will actually it's a hard way to describe it, but it'll actually help you basically push the pedal and makes it a lot nicer to get those precise inputs to 100%. Whereas on another set of pedals, it requires a lot more force. And that's where it gets a little bit more difficult in actually being able to do it at the same pace as someone on hoist and pedals. It is a lot quicker to apply the clutch quickly on these pedals than any other set I've used. So that is a slight advantage I have used from my knowledge of all the other pedal sets I've used from the TH, uh, 3PA, uh, T3PA uh, pedals I think it was by Thrustmaster and the Logitech G29, Driving Force GT and G27 pedals as well. That is the biggest advantage I have noticed from going to these pedals. Beautiful set of pedals, but that is the only place they are quicker other than looking absolutely gorgeous. In terms of your sim racing rig or your sim racing seat, there's nothing really that can affect your pace in the game, so none of that affects it. But making sure you've got a good sim racing posture is important, using the right muscles of your body to turn the wheel and get all your inputs in place. And also making sure you don't hurt your wrist, because it is very easy to do if you're doing long stints through hairpins, just bending your wrists in awkward ways, holding the wheel. So, a quick little test to make sure you've got a nice arm distance to the wheel is just to put your uh, hand straight out, and your wheel should actually be hitting the top of your wrists. It's a nice little way to test, and it's a lot. Uh, it's a way that a lot of sim racers follow, making sure you've got a nice bend in your arms as well, so where you're not overextending and you know using your back muscles, your traps, and everything when you really shouldn't be using them at all. So other than that, no pace gained through your rig. Confidence is a big thing as well, and that's a point I want to make before I wrap up this video, is that being familiar and having the confidence in your own equipment is going to be a much bigger gain than buying any of these upgrades will be. Someone who knows a Logitech G25 inside and out, for example, is going to be quicker than someone on a direct drive wheel who's just recently upgraded. That's just the case. Being familiar with your equipment is what gains you a second. It's what gains you a second and a half. It's what allows you to develop as a better driver. These upgrades, like I said earlier, steering wheel, maybe three to four hundredths. Having a handbrake, one to two tenths in rally cross only. Double clutch, 1.5 seconds, but only once per race. So, all of these things don't really add up to knowing your equipment inside and out. If you're familiar and you're comfortable with your current equipment, stick with it unless you really do want to upgrade or you need to upgrade. Sometimes it's just not worth it in terms of getting better performance out of your results. Guys, I am wrapping it up there. Thank you all so much for watching this. I know it's been a slightly longer one, but do you prefer the longer videos? Do you not? Let me know. Either way, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for 400 subs on YouTube. Closing in on 300 on Twitch as well. Streaming Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. New YouTube videos every single Thursday. Leave a like, hit the subscribe button. And otherwise, keep being you. Good luck in your races throughout this week. Hopefully you get some amazing results. I'll see you all in the next one, guys. Peace.